Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. As I say, we're going to give you a talk about photogrammetry surveying of the AEC industry. Just before we start, can I get a rough kind of show of hands? How many people are from the architecture, engineering, construction industry, but not involved directly with surveying? Okay, a few. And the people involved with surveying? A lot more. Okay, cool. So we know to focus it more on that side now. So myself, I work for Capita, a um, large company doing all kinds of architecture, engineering, construction, uh, consultancy, and I've got Rob Clark with me from Excitec, or I, uh, what do you call yourself, BIM. Okay, so we started looking at photogrammetry, we started way back asking ourselves a question. For every project we find, we have to go to site, we sit in the office, we go, we've won this project, all we need to know is what is, we need to know what is the height of it, what's the floor area, what's the length of something, what's the volume. Every project, be it a building, a railway, a highway, it's always we need to know certain bits of information before we can start on that project. The way we were looking at it was to say, well, what if? What if we had that information earlier? What if we had more of that information? What if we knew where things were? What if we knew some of the constraints on the site right at the outset before we started that project, before we started investing lots of time? Basically, what if we knew everything about that project before we started it? It would make things a lot easier. Unfortunately, we don't know everything, so there's things we have to do. So moving on from that stage, we said, OK, our traditional project, we need to know this information. We need to know what's there. What options do we have at hand to be able to do that? So we started off right at the start, kind of the thing most people pick up. You get a project come through, Google Earth, Street View, online mapping, that kind of stuff. It's a great start to find out the basic information about your site. So you can type in a postcode, you can view what it looks like, aerial mapping, maybe some street view, et cetera, et cetera. You get a good understanding of kind of what's on that site um, and a little bit of information around it. Next up, next stage, kind of visual on site. So you're going to send someone along there. They're going to take a camera, a little notebook, make some notes, maybe a couple of hand sketches. Again, a bit more information. Next along the line was kind of pen, paper, and tape. And this is kind of the non-surveyor version, just measuring up some widths, lengths, heights. Then you go on to the kind of full commission 2D survey. So you send someone else out there to kind of go and capture this information for you. And then moving on to laser scanning. So those we looked at were our kind of current options and some um, different steps we can take on a project. Moving forward from those options, we said, OK, all great options, but they're different in terms of time, cost, and what data we get. So we've mapped them kind of onto this graph. So you see right down the bottom here, we've got kind of the Google, the street view, the mapping. So on the data captured, there's really not very much. I mean, you might see what it looks like on plan. You might notice a couple of trees around. Um, you might be able to draw a box around it and find out an area, but it doesn't give you that much. But then again, in time and cost, it's also very little. It's probably going to take you no more than 20 minutes, half hour, sat at a computer have a look what's going on. So next along, site visits and photos. Again, going to cost more time, um, obviously depending on where your site is and how far you've got to travel, but you're going to get a little bit more information. You can take some more dimensions, more pictures. Next one along, site measurements. Again, a bit more time on site, a bit more measurement, a bit more data captured. And moving on to the traditional survey. So we think generally along these four options we've got, there's a kind of direct correlation between the more time you spend on site, the more data you're going to capture. And then this thing called laser scanning came in and completely flipped it around and said, well, in fact, we can actually spend the same amount of time on site, equal time, a bit more, wherever, wherever you want to put that laser scan dot, you've got a lot more data captured, 10 times, 20, 100 times more data, but in the same kind of time of cost as a traditional survey. Uh, we said, really, for us working on our projects, there's something missing in this gap. We said, we want more than traditional survey. We want more than a couple of points here, there, and everywhere. But we don't really need the full detail that we get with a laser scan with billions of points and taking up lots of storage space. So that's where we came in, looking at photogrammetry. And we reckon, again, you can judge on this graph where you think it goes. But for us, it gives us a lot more data than normal methods but also a lot quicker and a lot less uh, cost. So I hand over to Rob, who will uh, talk you through the photogrammetry side. Yes. So um, 
Yeah, photogrammetry is one of those workflows that if you've never heard of it before, the first time I heard about it, you sort of go, really, that's possible? Um, so this is a, uh, we were working uh, with our friends over at Topcon uh, and Resource Group actually flew this uh, UAV. But what this is is a Topcon Falcon F8, which is a very stable vehicle. Um, and what it's doing is carrying a Sony Alpha 37 megapixel camera. Um, and what it's doing is it's taking photographs at a 90% um, overlap um, along all facades of the building and the bridge in this particular uh, in this particular site. The reason for doing that is for the purposes of photogrammetry. And the photogrammetry process is simply to capture photographs and have software um, uh, build a uh, have software ascertain the positions of objects using photographs and also the difference in measurements and the measurements within this uh, on the site as well. So this was our site, very sunny day. We were on the Isle of Wight, nice day at the seaside. Um, uh, it's on the, uh, it's a place called Shanklin, some of you may know it. And basically what it is, is a, it's a, there's a the topographical, the topogra topography of this site is there's hotels along the top, beach along the bottom, big cliff face. So the, how they address that to get people down to the beach is they have a bridge that comes across and a lift shaft that comes down. The bridge itself was in need of refurbishment, which is what Capita were employed to, uh, to do and why we needed the actual scan. You can see this is the kind of bridge we were looking to replace on this project. So we ran this like a project. It was, it was a... Um, it is a research, it's an, it was an R&D project, if you like, to understand, um, understand the viability of photogrammetry, as Mike said. So we went through it like a normal project, and we went through the various obvious stages there, looking at the actual, the most important part, the scoping element, which we'll talk about in a second, the access, the capture, the production, and the use of that information. So yeah, as I say, I think scoping is probably the most important stage in many ways on any project. And we went through a series of questions of which, you know, there are just a few up on the screen there. You know, there was many, many questions, but principally, you know, I'm a big believer in that we should always ask why. Why are we doing this? What do we want? So what did we want from that model deliverable? You know, what did, how, how were we, what were we trying to get to? What were we going to do with that information? How were we going to use that information? And Really, what level of accuracy we're we trying to achieve here? What what we're trying to get out of it? What we're trying to, again ties in with what we're going to use it for, I suppose. And obviously, what are the challenges going to be on this particular type of project? What are the technical um, what are the technical things that we need to think about and and work with? So we had a look at what we want, and rather obviously, the answer to the first one is lots of photographs. Uh, we wanted the photogrammetry model, so we wanted that 3D space. But in order, to, um, in order to start modeling from this and actually continue the refurbishment of it, we wanted to be able to make sure that it was obviously dimensionally accurate. Bear in mind we're using photographs. So how we actually make sure that things are correctly scaled and can be measured from. So we took verification. We wanted to get a CAD mesh to make sure that we could snap to it, that we could actually work and uh, work from it. And also, as a nice, almost nice to have, really, we wanted to make sure that we had a model for our visualization as well, so FBX, which is an Autodesk um, format for visualization. So the next stage um, we went through was to ensure that we had appropriate access. Now, there are lots of issues with access, as I'm sure many of you will already appreciate, making sure that we have a permission make sure we have the owner's permission, make sure that there are no objections locally to, to us to fly in a vehicle in that area. But one of the interesting things that we found on this project, maybe something we didn't appreciate when we set out, was that the, um, flight res the airspace restrictions in the UK are, are more complicated than you might imagine. The, uh, we, um, you know, I think we'd all probably appreciate that if you're flying near an airport, to find a vehicle near the airport, near an airport, that, that's a quite an obvious, um, yeah, you're not going to be able to do that. But we were surprised when we realized how, exactly how many restrictions there were. So um, the first site that we chose for this experiment, for this R&D project, was a site actually in Kent. And, um, and it, 
we thought it wouldn't be a problem. It was in a nice and open area, countryside. And it turned out that I think it was a, was it an aerial mask? It was about five minutes down the road from Dover. And uh, yeah. yeah, they said there's a big aerial mast at Dover contacting lots of ships and they don't like people flying nearby it. I think they got about a five, six mile exclusion radius yeah. around it. So. so there are a whole number of things that cause exclusions within the UK, aerial masks and so forth. And, and those exclusions can vary out from different altitudes as well. So it's not just a geographical X and Y, you need to think about the elevation as well. So uh, we came across, uh, thanks to Resource Group actually, we came across this good website, which we would sort of point your attention to, which is skydemonlight.com. Really, uh, really good resource. And basically type in any location in the UK and it will tell you exactly what those air restrictions are. So if this is something that, if this is something that you would consider doing, that's probably a very good place to start before you, get, you start taking any more of your time uh, down this path. Okay, so step one of the process we took is we got site, we sorted out the access, we've done the scoping, we had to take lots of pictures. And what you can see come up here are some of the actual pictures we took on that day and the video again of the drone flying up on site there. And this shows the kind of overlap we took between those pictures. They all move very slightly between them to get a good overlap. Um, all high res pictures, 37 megapixel camera. And I think in total, we took about 680 images of this tower and bridge to capture this project. So with photogrammetry, more photos is better. You can't take too many photos until the point where you come to process it. So, We've taken the photos. Uh, we were on site for about two and a half, three hours. I think taking those pictures wasn't too long. Again, when you compare it to kind of the days on site of a traditional survey. Um, next up, we had to process those photos. So we got used to a lot of time spent sat looking at wheels and watching it process and coming back after a cup of coffee and going, no, it's still not done. It's gone up 1%. So it takes a long time to process. Oh, come on. So as this was an R&D project, as Rob mentioned, uh, we were looking at, there's lots of different photogrammetry softwares out there on the market. Which one's best? What advantages? What are disadvantages? Um, obviously, we're quite short on time in our presentation today, so we won't go through all of the uh, ups and downs of each of these, but we've got another hour-long presentation we've done before showing these. So just briefly, the first one we looked at was Autodesk Recap 360 and Autodesk Memento. Um, two good products. They're pros of them. They're up in the cloud, which is useful because it means when you're doing your processing, almost irrespectively of how long it takes, it's not tying up your machine. You can send it up, off, done, it gets processed, you get an email when it comes back. That's great. And it's also cheap for low use because it's kind of in the cloud, it's software subscription, it's relatively cheap. If you're doing the occasional one, you just throw few quid each time you do it. Downside to that, however, upload times, trying to upload all your photos onto the internet. If you're taking 37 megapixel pictures, they're quite large file sizes. And the software's actually, at the moment, got a maximum limit of 250 photos, which I say, as we said, we've already been to site by this point and captured 680 photos. So limiting us to 250 was a bit of a restriction. Um, and also, they're slow for cloud technology. Um, this is kind of personal opinion, really, but I thought cloud technology is fast, quick processing. In actual fact, for this project, bear in mind 250 photos, it took three days of processing. Seems quite long, um, but when I come onto the others and tell you how long they took, you can make your own decisions on that one. So next, we looked at Agisoft. Really good bit of software, seems to be used quite a lot by a lot of the commercial people, I'm sure. Many people in this room have used it. They've looked at uh, photogrammetry. Lots of features on it. Great reporting out. You can check the accuracy stuff. Um, lots of export options. You've got various different point cloud files. You've got 3D PDFs, etc., etc. It's a really good part of it. However, uh, downside is it is quite expensive um, compared to some of the other options. And also, it took the longest processing for us. It did provide one of the best outputs, but it did take a long time. I think it took four days for the Agi soft software. However, saying that, 
it took a long time processing. That was processing the full 780 images in four days on a, uh, I think it was an 80 gig uh, special graphics computer compared to the 250 processed in the cloud that took three days. So technically it's better, I'd say. Another one we looked at was uh, Bentley's Context Capture, it used to be called Acute 3D. Um, again, very similar product, uh, got some other advantages, things like farm processing. So if you've got a render farm or something in your office, you can have several computers all set up and you can say, you do that 10%, you do that 10%. And so you can see if you've got three or four days worth of processing on one computer, you split that over 10, you end up turning that down into a few hours processing. Nice to have the ability to pause as well. If you are doing it on one computer and you need to use that computer for something else, the ability to pause it halfway through, come back to it, um, which most of the others don't have. It's either start or stop. Uh, however, it does split the exports up currently. Uh, I think they're doing some work on that, but we had to process it in 1,600 different jobs, and that meant that at the end of it, we got 1,600 different point clouds out, which we then had to join all back together again. It's a bit of a pain. And then last off, we used Capturing Reality, uh, which is a new software. I think it only came out of beta and commercial release a couple of months ago. Uh, we found it really easy and straightforward to use, having not come from a kind of surveying background. Uh, it had the fastest processing time, again, processing the full 780 photos. Um, and the other benefit is it's got quite a good pricing system of how much of this you're doing and how much detail you need to go into. Um, I think they've got a stand outside so if you want any more details on them. Uh, however, it did, at the time we tested it in the beta version, lack some export options, didn't have as many as the Bentley and the Agisoft. And like I say, it's only recently been released or this was pre-released when we used it. So it's probably still got a few glitches and bug bugs to work out over the next few months. So that was our findings. Um, Oh, so on the capturing reality, that took one day, and the Bentley context capture took three days to process. So you can see there really was a massive um, benefit in using the capturing reality on this one. So after all of that processing and time watching that, I'll show you a video now that shows you the output we've got from this project. So this was from the Agisoft scan. This is viewed in Autodesk Recap software. You can see the point cloud build in there as we kind of scan around. We both got this out. I think you sent it over to me, Rob, when um, we first got this. Um, obviously, we'd set it running. We watched the computer ticking through. Four days later, we got this out at the end of it. But after that four days, I actually thought, wow, this is really impressive. We've given the computer 600 and something photographs. We've got this at the end. I mean, if you had sent that to me and said, we've been on site with a laser scanner and got this point cloud, I couldn't really tell the difference. All of the edges were sharp, the lines were neat, there was no kind of wobbly edges as we expected to get from photogrammetry. So overall, we were really impressed with the kind of quality of the output we got from this. You can see things like the elevation there helps highlight it, especially considering it's such a difficult site with the cliff face there as well and access around it. So that's our. 3D model, we got that data out. What are we then going to do for it? Um, like I said we were at Capita, we're in charge of replacing the bridge. So our next job was to say, right, we've got all this information now. Coming back to my first slides on collecting it, what do we do with it? So we use this to bring into Autodesk Revit software. Um, our structural engineers who are designing the new bridge wanted to use this as a background for their new bridge design so they could measure up how far it was from the cliff to the lift and where they were going to put the new steel in and also be able to actually show that to the client um, so that they could see how this is going to fit in public consultations of showing new design in context of the existing. So this will just run through. I think this overall took about 10 minutes to do, um, but this video sped up to about a minute long. So for anyone who's used to the Revit, we've gone in, imported the point cloud drawn in a couple of levels for the top of the lift, the bottom, the middle of it. And then we can come into our drawing views. And you, you can see here is a snip through the point cloud. It shows just how kind of crisp these edges are. So we can come in on top of that and use that point cloud as the basis for our design model. 
and we can trace over the various aspects of this so that we can rebuild the tower into there we go, we'll trace over there. So we're just tracing over the walls, snap into the point cloud, building it top to bottom, and in a second you'll see we'll be able to then visualize that in 3D. We can turn the point cloud off. We can see, so in a couple of minutes, we've ended up getting a full, accurate design model uh, of what's, exact, what's existing on site. And again, a few more minutes, and we've got all the rebates and recesses built into that as well. And then finally, we put in our new design model, and we can see exactly what that new bridge structure is going to look like and how it's going to interact with the new lift. So that was that. So our next question, we said, that's fantastic. It helps us show exactly what we need. It helps us illustrate our design, helps us work out dimensions between stuff. How do we take that forward from a research project into a new um, kind of method of working on projects? So we said, what if we don't have access to a drone? What if we're on a site where we're a bit limited? Is there any use in photogrammetry? And we said, yes. So this video will highlight on that same site whilst we were flying with the drone. This was 108 photographs taken on an iPhone 6 camera and then processed in exactly the same way. But you can see even just being from the ground, the detail you can capture, the straightness of the walls. And I think this in a moment will go on. So I'll just pause it here. You can kind of see there the detail that we get in here of every single mortar joint in this mesh and you might just be able to see on this side over here how this scales out. So with photogrammetry, it's not an accuracy of the whole model is plus or minus 5 millimetres, plus or minus 10 millimetres. With photogrammetry, the more photos you take of certain areas, the more detail you'll get in that area and the more um, tolerance you'll get. So what we found is over at this side, where we took less photos of this bit of the wall, we ended up getting less accuracy in there, which is exactly what we wanted because we wanted to focus on this main center of the model here. So you see it'll just spin around. We can view this in different ways. So we've got some kind of solid mass there. It go into our x-ray mode. So again, we thought this has got real advantage, things like trial pits. We do bridge inspections, um, road maintenance. We can take just a standard phone camera that most people have in their pocket and use that to capture real life details on site quickly and easily. So I hand over to Rob to wrap you up with our conclusions from this. One of the things we were trying to prove with this research and obviously technically it seemed to stack up. You know, the results that we got I think exceeded our expectations. I think as Mike said, we expected to get white, woolly, soft edges, not very good results. However, the reality was that, you know, as Mike said, it was actually quite difficult to tell the difference between that and point clouds that we've seen in the past. So then, of course, viable, um, commercial um, arguments come in. Obviously, um, you know, is this viable? You know, is it, what's the cost of this against other methods? Now, first of all, going right down to that last bullet point, as much as we'd love to, and, and maybe if there's anyone in the room that wants to take on the challenge, um, we haven't actually had this site laser scanned yet. So it would be interesting to see the comparison of it with a, a, a traditional laser scan and how that would have been achieved. Um, but what, we, what CAPTA had done previously is they had traditionally surveyed this site using um, a cherry picker vehicle, a vehicle mounted access platform. And that cost, um, the quote we got for that was um, just over £2,000 for the day. Um, however, I think there's additional costs in there when you consider the cost of the personnel that's needed on site. Um, and also, um, <laughs> in this particular case, um, the site was on the Isle of Wight. Um, getting a cherry picker to the Isle of Wight is uh, not the easiest logistical uh, challenge. So um, it, it, there was a few extra uh, challenges and expense around that as well. So, so you know, all in all, you know, a reasonably expensive exercise to do a traditional survey in this method. Um, the photogrammetry survey cost us um, just over a thousand pounds, one thousand two hundred and fifty pounds for the day, um, and that included them coming to site and processing the 
photographs and sending us the photographs for us. It should say we did all the processing ourselves. So the, the actual creation of the model and so forth was between us, between Excitec and Capita. Um, but the actual capture of the photographs, um, uh, the actual capture of the photographs themselves was done by a company called Resource Group. And, um, and they actually, uh, and, and that was the charge that we had for that day. I was challenged to, after this research program, there was a lot of lessons to learn, a lot. But it was, um, it was really, you know, if you could pick out five lessons that we learned from running this particular project, what would they be? Um, you know, going on what I emphasized earlier on, it probably won't surprise you to learn me to say that. The first one is make sure you understand your access on the site in terms of no-fly areas and make sure that you're actually able to use this process on the site that you would want to use. Um, the other thing that we um, learned really was to make sure that we had um, known measurements on site that we could check. Um, obviously, photographs themselves, when you get photographs out, um, um, with some of the technologies, with some of the softwares, it, you do need to scale that particular model because obviously photographs themselves don't have a sense of distance in them. So you obviously need to scale that model um, in relation to known measurements that you have on site. So putting a couple of markers down on site, making sure you know those measurements so that you can accurately scale it is a very good idea. It's actually worth mentioning that a number of these softwares that are actually bringing in um, GPS tag um, capability. So for example, Recap just got that, Autotest Recap got that functionality. Um, also, ensure the photographs are of very good quality. Um, you know, blurry photographs and so forth would do the distance, know the limits, um, and expect and plan for it long processing times, um, because that certainly is an issue. So I'd like to just finish and wrap that up by saying, moving forwards from that, we found huge advantages in it. As you've seen, cost basis, time, um, the actual output we get. And this was another one we'd just done recently. This is kind of a couple of miles of highway. Again, it's captured in kind of a morning's work, um, really cheap to capture. We've got a huge amount of data from there. And you can see just up in the top right of the screen there, there's that little bit of red wall, which we've then used to uh, do our design from. So again, we've done it on building front, but also from a civils infrastructure front, it works as well. So. The top two pictures show our design of a retaining wall versus the point cloud, so we can check everything fits. Uh, the point cloud on this case was captured in January. Uh, our design was done in February and up to the middle of March. And then these photos down the bottom here were taken about two weeks ago, um, two, three weeks ago, actually showing them on the site and they're now finished and they've handed the road over. So part of using uh, photogrammetry capture we've got from capturing the information to design to on-site finished in four months which I thought was really impressive. Okay, thank you very much.